<coughs> Excuse me. Um, I'm going to read um, an article that I found that I thought was rather interesting. And I welcome your feedback. Okay, where are you? The article is entitled, What is this Linux thing and why should I try it? Dated March the 12th, 2008, and the author is Mackenzie Morgan. Lately, Linux has been receiving quite a bit of notice. Between the Asus ePC, the One Laptop Per Child Project, and Dell's new Ubuntu line, Intel's Classmate PC, and EverX's Green PC, Linux has been getting a lot of attention from computer manufacturers. It seems every new computer in the last year has had Linux. But to most people, that doesn't mean anything. It probably leaves you wondering. What's this Linux thing everyone's talking about? So, what is this Linux thing? Linux is an operating system, just like Windows and OS X are operating systems. It talks to the computer's hardware, makes sure everything is going okay, and then you run programs on top of it, because it's pretty much always because it pretty much always comes with a standard set of tools, the GNU tools, which are very similar to the tools found on big Unix systems, OS X being one of them. It is sometimes called GNU Linux. A side note, a lot of people prefer that to be the proper term. I use it interchangeably, but I've been nicked for not calling it GNU Linux. Back to the article. If you've ever used a Unix system, you'll feel right at home. When someone says they use Linux, what they mean is they use a distribution, also known as distro, that is spelled D-I-S-T-R-O, of Linux. Without the GNU tools or any applications, it can be a little useless. A distro is a software bundle. It includes the Linux kernel, the part that actually talks to the hardware, and the GNU tools, and whatever applications the person or people who started that distro thought were useful, all configured in a way that they think works well. Since not everyone has the same idea of a good system, there are a few hundred distros out there, each having <coughs> excuse me, its niche. Though often many distros share a niche. There are distros for old, low-spec computers, like DSL, and distros like Sabaeon for high-end computers to show off their bling. Some distros, like Gentoo, I don't know if that's Gentoo or Gentoo, could somebody please correct me if I'm wrong, are loved by those who like to tweak everything for the best possible performance, just like that guy down the street who's always tweaking his hot rod. Side note, and forgetting the muffler while he's at it. Back to the article. Some distros, like SUS Linux Enterprise Desktop, SLED, are aimed at corporate desktop use with support contacts. Red Hat, on the other hand, is for corporate server use. Then there are CentOS op and OpenSUSE, which are just like Red Hat and SLED, except without the support con mm, excuse me, without the support contracts which corporate environments often require. Fedora is a desktop version of Red Hat aimed at home users, though my school uses it in the computer labs. Debian is known for its stability, which makes it great for servers. But since it usually includes older software, many desktop users prefer Ubuntu to have an up-to-date system. There are also tons of others, but those are some of the most common. Just a side note, as far as accessibility goes, Ubuntu happens to be one of the best. Ubuntu and Solaris, because they both come with the Orca screen reader, which is specifically for the GNOME desktop. It comes pre-installed. Back to the article. Why should I use it? 
There are a number of reasons you may want to try Linux on your computer. For me, the main reason to switch was to try something new. I wanted to know what else was out there besides Windows, which I was bored with, and OS X, which I don't like. Trying something new and learning more about how computers work might not be your thing, though. So here are some other reasons. It's free. You don't have to pay anything or to try or use Linux. Most of the software for it is totally free of charge, too. Some distros are for pay, like Red Hat, but in that case you're paying for a support contract. They are generally available without a support contract as well, such as with CentOS. You're free. One of the things we say about Linux is that while it is often free gratis, free as in beer, <laughs> it is always free libre, free as in speech. What that means is that there are a few freedoms which come a few freedoms which come along um, with it. Again, a few freedoms that come along with it. You are free to use it and any other floss for whatever purpose you want. A side note, floss stands for free... I'm sorry, I forgot what the L is, but it's um, free... Okay, I think it's free Linux open source. Back to the article. You are free to study the program and adapt it to your needs. Even if you cannot code, if there is something you want changed, there is probably a 12-year-old down the street who could make the changes for you. You are free to share it with your friends without being branded, to a, so branded a software pirate. Just about anything you want to do with Floss, you can, you can do, unless you want to change the license to make it stop being Floss. That's pretty much... That's a pretty wide open license. It's secure. Linux was built, like Unix, to be a multi user system. There are permissions in place to maintain the security of the system. Users do not run as administrators all the time, so actions that affect the system must explicit be, uh, explicitly be allowed. Software cannot be installed unless a user says, as administrator, to explicitly allow that person, that item to happen. So viruses cannot install themselves. DOS and its child Windows were not built with this security model in mind. They run under a set of assumptions which just are not true in today's world. They assume that only one person will ever touch the computer that that person has all the knowledge necessary to be a good system administrator, and that nobody else can reach that computer, such as through a network. Given the existence of the internet, we know that there are plenty of people who can reach our computers. What we need to do is keep them from getting into our computers and causing harm. Linux s system of permissions prevents this. Windows assumption that any action being performed is being allowed by the administrator is what allows malware to self-install. Microsoft has taken steps in its newest version of Windows Vista to copy it, this system of checking with the administrator before it allows certain actions to be done. But the way in which it ha was done seems to be more intrusive. It's always obvious why the system is asking permission if you are using a Unix-like system, such as Linux, FreeBSD, or OS X. I am going to have to stop here because the timing is about to conclude. I will finish up this article in a part two, so please stay tuned.